On this week's Vaticano, the Catholic Church recognizes two new saints, Pope Francis celebrates the Jubilee for priests, and we follow the winning team of this year's soccer championship called the Clericus Cup. All this and more now on Vaticano. On Sunday, June the 5th, two new saints were elevated to the glory of the altars. One of them was the Polish priest Stanislas of Jesus and Mary Papczynski, founder of the Congregation of Marian Priests of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary. He's known for his work in favor of the poorest. Also, the Swedish religious sister, Mary Elizabeth Hesselblad, was declared a saint. She was raised Lutheran and converted to Catholicism when she was a teenager. She took the habit of the Brigitines, dedicating her life to restoring this order all over the world. To pay tribute to the new saints, thousands of faithful gathered in St. Peter's Square, participating in the rite of canonization that opened the liturgical celebration. The prefect of the Congregation of the Causes of Saints, Cardinal Angelo Amato, joined by the postulators of the respective causes, publicly asked Pope Francis for the canonization of the Blessed. After reading a brief biography of both, Pope Francis pronounced the formula of canonization and received the relics of the new saints, Stanislas of Jesus and Mary Papczynski and Mary Elizabeth Hesselblad. During his homily, the Holy Father recalled the victory of Christ over pain and death. Nella passione di Cristo c'è la risposta di Dio in the Passion of Christ, we find God's response to the desperate and at times indignant cry that the experience of pain and death invokes in us. He tells us that we cannot flee from the cross, but must remain at its foot as Our Lady did. In suffering with Jesus, she received the grace of hoping against all hope. This was the experience of Stanislaus of Jesus and Mary and Maria Elizabeth Hesselblad, who are today proclaimed saints. They remain deeply united to the passion of Jesus, and in them the power of his resurrection was revealed. Also, Pope Francis proclaimed the greatness of the mercy of Jesus, who gave his life for us to free ourselves from death and give us eternal life. He takes our sins upon himself, takes them away, and gives us back alive to Mother Church. All this happens in a special way during this holy year of mercy. The Church today offers us two of her children who are exemplary witnesses to this mystery of the resurrection. Both can sing forever in the words of the psalmist, You have changed my mourning into dancing, O Lord. My God, I will thank you forever. Let us all join in saying, I will extol you, Lord for you have raised me up. Before leaving, the Pope prayed the Angelus and took the opportunity to ask for prayers for a peaceful world where justice reigns. On the Solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in Rome, thousands of priests joined Pope Francis in St. Peter's Square to celebrate Mass. It was the culmination of a three-day jubilee for priests, a beautiful moment to share and celebrate their common vocation to the priesthood. The Pope centered his message to them on the heart, their own and that of the Good Shepherd. Contemplating the heart of Christ, we are faced with the fundamental question of our priestly life. Where is my heart directed? It is a question we need to keep asking, daily, weekly. The great wealth of Christ's heart, said the Pope, is that it cuts the distance between God the Father and the people, bringing them to an encounter. So, too, the heart of Christ's priests knows only two directions, the Lord and his people. The heart of the priest is a heart pierced by the love of the Lord. For this reason, he no longer looks to himself, or should look to himself, but is instead turned towards God and his brothers and sisters. It is no longer a fluttering heart, allured by momentary winds, shunning disagreements and seeking petty satisfactions. Rather, it is a heart rooted firmly in the Lord, warmed by the Holy Spirit, open and available to our brothers and sisters. 
A shepherd after the heart of God has a heart sufficiently free to set aside his own concerns. He does not live by calculating his gains or how long he has worked. He is not an accountant of the Spirit, but a good Samaritan who seeks out those in need. For the flock he is a shepherd, not an inspector, and he devotes himself to the mission, not 50 or 60 percent, but with all he has. The Pope gave priests three elements to focus on, to help their hearts burn with the charity of Jesus, to seek out, to include, and to rejoice. And at the conclusion of Mass, Pope Francis showed the priests by example what it is to be a loving father, a good shepherd. Among them was Bishop Robert Barron, who participated in the Jubilee celebrations and gave a talk to English-speaking clergy gathered in Rome. He says priests need to experience that model of fatherhood from the Pope. The Pope is more than the leader. He's more than um, a guy with smart ideas. He's the father. He's the father of the whole Catholic Church, but in a very particular way of priests. I found when I was seminary rector, that was my primary role, was to be the spiritual father of that community. Uh, that's how the church is structured. And so um, without spiritual fatherhood, we drift. And so priests looking to him, hearing him, but more importantly, watching him in action, learn what they're supposed to be, the same way a child learns from his father. Um, so I think it's just super important that he personally is here to shepherd us and to father us. A day prior to Mass, as part of the Jubilee program of activities, Pope Francis toured three major Roman basilicas, giving meditations to the priests of the world on mercy. Bishop Barron says that the Pope's emphasis on mercy illustrates what he would like to see in his priests. I think priests in the vision of Pope Francis are some of the key players in communicating the divine mercy to the world. He sees that as our primary mission. So we're other Christ. What was Christ doing but bearing the Father's mercy to the world? That's our job as other Christ. So I, just, I think he sees the mercy emphasis as the best way to renew the priesthood for our time. That's as I listen to him talking to priests, I hear that over and over again. The Jubilee for Priests followed closely on the heels of the Jubilee for Deacons. In the month of June, Pope Francis is also celebrating the Jubilee for the Sick. During the general audience catechesis, Pope Francis noted the meaning of Jesus' first miracle at the wedding feast of Cana. At the wedding feast of Cana, Jesus starts his signs, revealing the Father's love and the deeper relationship with men. He manifests himself as the spouse of the people of God, and he unites us to himself with a new alliance of love that we, his family, have to protect and extend to all. In this context of the alliance, the observation that Mary makes to Jesus that wine is lacking is important. This is a traditional element of the messianic banquet and symbolizes the abundance of the banquet and the joy of the feast. For that, Jesus, in converting the water of the purification rituals into new wine, makes an eloquent gesture. He transforms the law of Moses into the gospel, bearer of happiness. On the other hand, the words of Mary, do what he tells you, entrust a new mission to the church and shape the program of Christian life which is set in serving the Lord, listening to his word, and putting it in practice, getting ever closer to taking the good wine of salvation from this source, which never stops springing out of the pierced side of Christ. Thanks for watching. Stick around for more on Vaticano. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. International judges and magistrates were convened in the Vatican on June the 3rd and the 4th for high-level meetings to discuss the worldwide fight against human trafficking and organized crime. The summit was the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences third in as many years, geared at ending modern slavery. In 2014, religious leaders were gathered to advance the same cause, and in 2015, it was mayors of major world cities who were invited. On the afternoon of June 3rd, Pope Francis paid this year's gathering of judges and magistrates a visit. 
Sitting among them, he congratulated their work in favor of human and social progress. And before leaving, he asked them to make an extraordinary effort to promote the reintegration of prisoners into society. This subtle interplay of justice and mercy with a view to reinstatement applies to those responsible for crimes against humanity, as well as to every human being. It thus applies a fortiori, and in a particular way, to those victims who, as the term itself indicates, are more passive than active in the exercise of their freedom, having fallen into the clutches of today's new slave masters. All too often these victims are betrayed even in the most private and sacred aspects of their person, that is to say, in the love they aspire to give and receive. Their family owes it to them, and their suitors or husbands promise it, but then sell them into the forced labor and prostitution market, or the organ trade. On June the 4th, Pope Francis met participants in meetings of the Pontifical Mission Societies. The group is composed of four missionary societies. One of them is the Pontifical Missionary Union, founded a hundred years ago through inspiration from Blessed Paolo Manna. Pope Francis referred to the Blessed as an example still today. Through the intuition of Blessed Paolo Manna and the mediation of the Apostolic See, the Holy Spirit has led the Church to have an ever greater understanding of her own missionary nature, later brought to maturation by the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council. Blessed Paolo Manna understood well that to form and educate to the mystery of the Church and to her intrinsic missionary vocation is an end that concerns all the holy people of God in the variety of states of life and of ministries. The Missionary Union has the task to illumine, inflame and act organizing priests and by them all the faithful in order of the missions. However, to form bishops and priests to the mission does not mean to reduce the Pontifical Missionary Union to a simple clerical reality, but to support the hierarchy in its service to the missionary nature of the Church proper to all. Faithful and pastors, the married and consecrated virgins, the Universal Church and the particular churches. On June the 1st, the Pope received a delegation from the Institute of Gynology in private audience. Representatives of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue were also present. Followers of Jainology, or Jains as they're known, preach compassion and non-violence towards all living things. They're present largely in the United Kingdom and India. Pope Francis encouraged their work for the protection of creation. I am glad about this encounter, an encounter that nurtures our responsibility in the care of creation, the gift we have all received, the gift of creation, that we may care for it. Creation is the mirror of God. It is the mirror of the Creator. It is the mirror of nature, nature as a whole. It is the life of nature and our mirror as well. We, all of us, like Mother Earth, because she gave us life and she guards us. I would even say Sister Earth, who walks with us on our journey of life. But our duty is also to take care of her like a mother or a sister. That is, with responsibility, with tenderness and with peace. Over 73 million young people worldwide struggle with unemployment. In this infomercial, the International Labour Office, ILO, emphasizes the urgency to create jobs for the youth. In early June, at this conference at the UN Geneva, the labour organization called for action in a rapidly changing world of work. And for some, this means opportunity and generates optimism. But for others, it brings insecurity and generates fear. During the session labelled Decent Jobs for Youth, the new Nuncio to the UN Geneva proposed to create more inclusive economic models that benefit not just a few, but society as a whole. It would involve passing from a revenue-directed economy, profiting from speculation and lending on interest, to a social economy that invests in persons by creating jobs and provi providing training. So it is my first, let's say, appearance since I arrived to Geneva and such a solemn event. First uh, impression is certainly that uh, questions of uh, labor, of workers, of so social problem that is uh, arising in recent is so general and it seems to be long term. 
So that is uh, probably quite a, quite a shock to me that very few delegations have spoken differently. The conference provided a unique opportunity to participants for stimulating and interactive discussions. I was I'm also impressed by the Muslim delegation that started with the quotation Quran. No? It is uh, somehow bringing a sacred environment to, to a very lay, uh, how to say, organized organization, I would say. On the other side, what I see is that there is enormous agreement on how we should proceed. We should continue to promote the idea that it is not longer sufficient to measure human progress in terms of economic growth and accumulation of material wealth. Pope Francis said the most serious of the evils that afflict the world these days are youth unemployment and the loneliness of the old. What we have to do is also to be attentive that when proposing the ideas, we know that there is a lot of people who has really the burden of creating or finding the jobs. That this is not just words. No. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. More on Vaticano begins now. Hundreds of sporting delegations from the entire world will participate in the Olympic Games in Rio from August the 5th to the 21st, 2016. Thousands of athletes will be arriving to the Brazilian city of Rio de Janeiro, where also from September the 7th to the 18th, the Paralympic Games will be held. The Vatican, for the first time, will be present with a small delegation that will represent an institutional but not sporting presence for the opening ceremony. This is meant to be a sign of the existing link between the Holy See and the International Olympic Committee. But what is the relationship between faith and sport? Cardinal Gianfranco Ravazzi, president of the Pontifical Council for Culture, explains it to us. I would say that the most important things to do in a culture, in faith, in sport, is to walk together, because these are the great languages of humanity, a humanity that expresses itself through art, through music, through sport, and through the research of the sense of life, the mystery that has been given to us through the faith. The delegation of Italian Paralympic athletes will form part of a very special initiative. It's a project from the Italian Paralympic Committee called Italian Paralympic House in Rio 2016. And it was presented here in the Vatican. Monsignor Melchor Sanchez de Toca, the Undersecretary of the Pontifical Council for Culture, told us what it's about and gave us details of the Holy See's participation. The Holy See, the Pontifical Council for Culture, has limited itself to putting the Paralympic Italian Commission in contact with the Archdiocese of Rio. They wanted to open the headquarters of their Paralympic delegation not in a luxurious country club or in a hotel as usual, but in a parish. A nice idea like this one was worth supporting, and that is what we have done. This idea comes up with the aim of inclusivity and to leave a message of hope to the young people of Brazil. We have not only helped out but collaborated. We have worked together with the Paralympics to seek to realize not just the great event, which is the Paralympics, but to seek something that remains as a memory, something that the Paralympics have lived through and have experienced as fatigue. They have to overcome themselves two times, not just their body, but also their physical limit. That can become a great symbol for the youth that lives in difficulty, for the people who have suffered in various degrees. That is why the Casa Italia is in the middle of a city quarter which suffers difficulty of the social type. And this mission continues in time. The message becomes in itself a living message that does not end with the Olympic Games. Loro messaggio diventa un messaggio vivo che non muore con le Olimpiadi. The Italian delegation will arrive at the Immaculate Conception Parish, located about three miles from the Paralympic headquarters. Dr. Luca Pancali, president of the Italian Paralympic Committee, explained the reasons this site was selected. The importance is most of all that we do something that has never been there before in the history of sport. 
Second, we wanted to select this specific location because we wanted to give a sign to Rio de Janeiro during the Paralympic Games so that this sign may help the disabled youth in Rio to give them the possibility, even in the poorest quarters of the city, the favelas, where it is hardest to give a great message. Rio, nelle favelas più difficili per riuscire a lanciare un grande messaggio. Two Italian athletes shared their admiration for the project. One of them is Martina Caironi, who will carry the flag in the opening parade. It will take place in a parish. Then there is an inclusion project with the community of Rio and the athletes of Italy. For me, it's a very revolutionary thing, it's something new, and I think this is a good thing. The Italian Paralympic House in Rio 2016 project responds also to an appeal from Pope Francis himself. I think that it is the symbol of what sport is. Sport is integration, is um, being together, is um, surely um, a lot of work, but it is together with a theme. So a Casa Italia in a, in a, in a place where you can stay in contact with the people of, of Rio. The symbol of Casa Italia is free persons that are embracing. So this is what, what is fantastic about it. Uh, well, I can't wait to be there at this point. The Italian Paralympic House in Rio 2016 project responds also to an appeal from Pope Francis himself. It has awakened enthusiasm everywhere. Everyone has found this choice that responds to Pope Francis' style of seeking contact with the peripheries very natural. We would like to see more relationship between the world of sport and the church, not only for the spiritual care of the athletes, but also remembering that sport is a great educational tool. And this has been understood by the great saints, St. Saint John Bosco, St. Saint Philip Neri, St. Leonardo Murialdo, Blessed Pino Pugliesi and many others who have brought the sport into parishes. In this 15th edition of the Paralympic Games, more than 4,000 athletes from 180 countries will be participating in 528 events across 22 sporting disciplines. Sport is an important dimension of the people's lives, especially of the people who have suffered accidents or suffered from disabilities from birth or illness. There are stories of overcoming. St. Paul spoke of sports as a metaphor for the spiritual life, also in the case of the people with disabilities. Sport is a school of life, a metaphor for life and a huge help in overcoming difficulties. Young men on the soccer field, players just like any others, except for one thing. There's a chance that they could one day be your parish priest. This is the Clericus Cup, the yearly event for which international seminarians, deacons and priests living and studying in Rome hit the soccer pitch. And yes, it really is this raucous. Sixteen teams vie for the top spot, representing many of the pontifical colleges and universities in the Eternal City. The tournament may have been around for a decade now, but it's the first time it has been played during a jubilee year. And even during the year of mercy. And even during the holy year of mercy, there's often no mercy on this field. There are winners and losers at the end of the tournament and at the end of every match in the Clericus Cup. There were 32 games played this year. As always, 124 goals scored and 45 cards given. Even if there is a major competitiveness on the field, at the end of the tournament, at the end of every game, they gather together in the center of the field to pray. And on May the 28th, after four months of tournament play, this year's championship game pitted Mater Ecclesia against the Pontifical Urban College. The final is being played between two historical colleges, the Pontifical Urban College, which is the College of Reference for Propaganda Fide, so missionaries for the evangelization of peoples, and on the other side, Mater Ecclesiae, the Mary Mother of the Church College with the Legionaries of Christ's College. They also have signed up for the last 10 years, 
and almost always have reached the final four. Only last year did they not pass on to the final part. So it's a historic seminary for the Clericus Cup. Both have already won this cup. In the final, the two sides come up big on defense. It's a 0-0 tie at the half, each striving to put home a winner. So I think Our Lady, Our Lady can help us out. I know Our Lady is not just for a soccer match, but you know, like we are giving our lives for Christ, and I think you know this is part of our life also. No, so I want the brothers and I want my my my, my seminarians to enjoy. As full time ends in a draw, they move on to a penalty shootout to decide this year's champion. Mater Ecclesia comes out on top, a win for the Marian side to close May, the month of Mary. Of course, it's not all about the victory. For us, when we look at this, it's not uh, all about playing, but it's about unity, the relationship that we have. I think this is a sign of unity, showing people that even us, we are human, we can do this thing. We know, we've got, uh, as we can see, there are some guys who have got uh, some skills. It's a way of, of uh, sharing you know, the field with other priests, other seminarists, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I like it, it's quite good, I mean, and between us, our, our team is very united, uh, no, it's, it's very fun, yeah. It's not just about what happens on the field. The organizing association, the Italian Sporting Center, has made sure the players take this year's theme out into the streets. This year we have wanted to add ourselves to this idea of the Jubilee. So the title of this Clericus Cup is Mercy Takes the Field, La Misericordia Scende in Campo. And we wish to stop for a day and reflect with so many of these young men who experience this tournament on what mercy going out into the field means. On mercy, this attitude of those who are closest to the weakest, those who are considered a waste and leftovers. So many of these young men, as a task, have gone out to coach some youngsters in different suburbs of Rome, different fields of Rome. And for a day they trained with these young people. It's about being close to them. This is how the church combines faith and sport, on and off the pitch, through the Clericus Cup.